Good morning and welcome to this tutorial on how to do a lung ultrasound exam in patients with COVID-19. The convex probe is the most universal probe for lung ultrasound. The linear probe allows a better definition of the pleural line and subpleural space, but the convex probe is absolutely enough to visualize everything that is needed for a complete exam. Use the specific lung preset if your machine includes a lung preset. Otherwise, you can use the abdominal preset. You should scan each point for the duration of at least one complete respiratory cycle, possibly for five, six seconds. The probe can be positioned in either a longitudinal manner, that is perpendicular to the ribs, or transverse, that is parallel to the ribs. In this video, we will show the transverse approach, which avoids the interference of the ribs. The first step is to visualize the pleural line, this hyperechoic horizontal line indicated by the green arrows, and the lung sliding, the horizontal movement of the pleural line synchronous with respiration. It is important not to confuse the pleural line with other hyperechoic lines that are not the pleural line, as in this case where the red arrow indicates a hyperechoic horizontal line which does not move with respiration and thus is not the pleural line. Here is another example where the red arrow indicates a hyperechoic horizontal line which is not moving, it is not sliding, and so it's not the pleural line. It may be a muscular fascia. The real pleural line is here underneath, not clearly visible, indicated by the green arrow. And what we have to consider is not just a general movement, but the sliding of the pleural line compared to the above structures. The depth should be about 8-10 cm, a bit less with lean patients and a bit more with obese patients. The gain should be optimized again to better visualize the pleural line. And the focus should also be positioned at the level of the pleural line. This is the scheme we are currently using in these patients. We have the right and left hemithorax divided into anterior, lateral, posterolateral and posterior areas based on the anatomical lines parasternal anterior axillary, posterior axillary, linea scapularis, and paravertebral. All these regions are then divided into upper and lower. If the posterior thorax is not accessible, the areas R7, R8, L7 and L8 will be discarded. Whenever possible, the posterior thorax should be evaluated because this is where the lesions are often present. If the patient cannot sit, the posterolateral chest is usually accessible by tilting the patients a bit on their side. For each area, we have to scan all the intercostal spaces and the worst pattern has to be considered. This scheme and this approach have been used for quite a long time, especially in intensive care units. There are other scanning schemes or approaches that can also be useful. We chose this one because it is both comprehensive and quick. Using a standardized scanning scheme is also useful because it allows some kind of scoring. 
Again, we've been using a previously validated score, assigning a score of zero to the picture of an I-rated lung when we have no B-lines or fewer than three B-lines. We have to be careful not to mistake Z-lines for B-lines. Z-lines are also hyperechoic vertical artifacts but without any specific pathological meaning. Compared to B-lines, Z-lines are less defined, more blurred, they do not clearly move with respiration and do not clearly start from the pleural line. We give a score of 1 in the presence of at least 3 B-lines or coalescent B-lines covering less or equal to 50% of the screen without clear subpleural alterations. And we give a score of 1P in presence of coalescent B-lines covering less or equal 50% of the screen with clear subpleural alterations. We give a score of 2 when B-lines cover more than 50% of the screen without clear subpleural alterations. And also in this case, we add the letter P if we have clear subpleural alterations with B lines covering more than 50% of the screen. The percentage should be referred to the part of the screen below the pleural line. And we give a score of 3 if we have a consolidation. In this case, it is useful to add some characteristics of the consolidation in the notes. If present, please add a note about pleural effusion as well. In the end, we sum up the scores of the most DI rated point for each area to get a final total score. We do not consider in the score the presence or absence of any pleural line alterations, but it is useful to report the number of areas with subpleural alterations, also because in these patients they are very frequent, which is compatible with the pathophysiology of the condition. It is crucial to recall that at the moment we have no clear data about the real diagnostic and or prognostic value of this approach and scoring. So it is very useful to standardize the exam, but you should use the info with caution and always integrate the lung ultrasound findings with the overall clinical picture and other tests. You may visualize very clear spared areas which are sites with a pattern of many coalescent B-lines immediately close to a pattern of I-rated lung and no B-lines. This is quite typical in non-cardiogenic lung damage. And now let's see together how to do an examination. The preparation of the probe is crucial. For full information, there are very detailed recommendation papers and we advise you to refer to these official documents. The probe should be protected with a cover, not necessarily sterile. Ultrasound gel should be applied above and below the cover. The cover should be disposable. Whenever possible, a dedicated machine should be devoted exclusively to COVID patients to minimize the risk of spreading the infection and to simplify cleaning procedures. The operator should be properly protected, as indicated by recommendations and specific documents. To protect the operator, it is advisable to use a third pair of gloves 
which will be discarded at the end of the exam. Let's start our exam with the right anterior thorax upper part. We place the probe on the skin and then we should optimize our image. The pleural line is our reference. We should be able to visualize it with its lung sliding. We should optimize the gain again to better visualize the pleural line and the lung sliding. The depth should be adjusted in order to have the pleural line at about halfway up the highest quarter of the screen. If possible, the focus should be positioned at the level of the pleural line. We then move to the right anterior thorax lower part. If we record a clip, it should last at least a full respiratory cycle, possibly 5-6 seconds. Let's go on to the right lateral thorax, first the upper part and then the lower part. For each area, it is advisable to scan all intercostal spaces considering the worst pattern, that is, the least aerated one. Next, we move on to the left anterior thorax, upper part. Again, we aim to clearly visualize the lung sliding. Now, we move to the left anterior thorax, lower part, although here we often find the heart. And for the left lateral thorax, we do the same as for the right hemithorax. If the patient is able to sit, we can scan the posterior chest. Here we are on the left posterior thorax upper part. Next, the posterolateral upper part where visualization of the lung is limited anyway by the scapula. Then posterior lower part and posterolateral lower part. Again, we have to scan all the intercostal spaces for each area, taking into account the worst pattern. At the lung base, we should visualize the so-called curtain sign, that is the interface between the lung and the liver or spleen, where we may also find a possible pleural effusion. When the exam is finished, both the probe and the machine should be properly cleaned. The cover should be removed and discarded. Next, the probe should be properly sanitized. We can use specific wipes or other products to clean the probe, the wires and also the keyboard and other surfaces. And again, we recommend reading the user manual of your echo machine to select the appropriate product. It is advisable to do a first cleaning round with the patient-specific gloves. Then, after correctly removing these gloves, we should clean the surfaces again. If possible, a dedicated machine would simplify these procedures and reduce the risk of spreading the infection. We hope this tutorial was useful Thank you very much for your attention.